استیو تولز زاده 1972 در سیدنی رمان نویس استرالیایی و نویسنده رمان های جوز از کل ریگ روان و هرچه بادا باده او محصل دبیرستان کیلارا بوده و در سال 1994 از دانشگاه نیوکاسل فارغ تحصیل شده تولز اولین رمانش جز از کل رو سال 2008 منتشر کرد که با استقبال زیادی روبرو شد و همون سال نامزد جایزه بوکر شد. اتفاقی نادر به عنوان کسی که با اولین کتابش نامزد چنین جایزه ای میشه. با وجود مدت زمان کوتاهی که از چاپش گذشته در حال حاضر جز از کل به عنوان یکی از بزرگترین رمان های تاریخ استرالیا مطرحه. این کتاب در ایران به بیش از هفتاد چاپ رسیده و یکی از پرفروشترین کتاب های دهه نود شمسی بوده. رمان ریگ روان هم در سال 2015 منتشر شده و مثل جوز از کل دارای زمینه های فلسفی در دل داستان های اجتماعیه. جدیدترین اثر این نویسنده به نام هرچه باد آباد در اردی بشمای امسال همزمان با عرضه جهانی در ایران نیز منتشر شده تولز در هرچه باد آباد با الهام گرفتن از مفهوم رجعت ابدی نیچه یه دنیای آخر و زمانی ساخته که در اون انسان ها غرق در حسد چیزهایی که از دست دادن به دام چرخه بی پایان مرگ و زندگی افتادن و دنبال راه خلاصی می گردن. هر سه اثر این نویسنده توسط نشر چشم با ترجمه پیمان خاکسار در ایران منتشر شده. در ادامه به بهانه جدیدترین کتابش هرچه باد آباد گفتگویی خواهم داشت با این نویسنده استیو تولز. امیدوارم از این مصاحبه لذت ببرید. Hello, Steve Toltz. Uh, I'm really honored and happy to welcome you to this interview. Um, I'm really excited and um, I thank you for the time you took to do this interview with us. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, to begin with, um, given that uh, this is your first interview with a Farsi medium, We are, we are very glad to hear you introduce yourself in your own words. Okay, uh, I am an Australian author. Um, my first book, A Fraction of the Whole, came out in 2008. My second book, Qu Quicksand, in 2015. And my third book, Here Goes Nothing, just came out. So it looks like I'm doing one every seven years. <laughs> That's really great. <laughs> Um, as you already may know, your two previous book, A Fraction of the Whole and Quicksand, has been translated and published in Iran and was very well received and popular. And your new book, Here Goes Nothing, has been recently published. Congratulations. And at first, we would like to know how, how the idea behind this wonderful new book uh, came to you. Well, I had an idea that in my mind, the three books are very loosely linked thematically. Um, so my first book, so I, I consider them a, a, a trilogy of fear. My mm -hmm. first book is about the fear of death. Uh, my second book about the fear of life and suffering. And then uh, this book, I wanted to do an, a third fe fear, which is the fear of the opinions of other people. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was considering how to tell a story that sort of touched lightly upon this, uh, I, this theme, um, when I think about like the persistence of human personality and flaws and preoccupations, I thought it would be interesting to see it go beyond the grave. Like if we take out... Um, say uh, the idea of death and oblivion um, and eternity, if we kind of push past that to see what would, what would remain. Um, and so, yeah, it was just a, a, an idea that I had. Yeah, it's great, I didn't know that. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
Is there, is there, you also mentioned it, um, but do you think <clears throat> there's also a connection between your recent book and your other books? I, I mean, like intertextuality wise also? Um, I, the connection is just my voice and my style and, you know, my preoccupations. Um, I am telling every story is in a different kind of universe a little bit. It's always Australia, but my Australia is not quite uh, everybody else's Australia. Um, you know, I have considered in the past whether I wanted it to be them to be linked in the same Australia's, but in, in the end, I, um, I've made them three different kind of universes, like the characters, you know, there is no world in which, because my characters live very large lives and some of them become famous, um, I, I want them to be in, in a different, in a kind of parallel universe so that um, they are not touching. So there's no real intertextuality. Yeah. And one of the uh, bold concepts of this book, of your new book, is, is the word beyond or like life after death and also this itself, which has been in your other two works too, you also mentioned. What is your opinion on that? How important is this concept uh, for you personally? Um, for me personally, it is something that I've sort of changed in my mind about. I certainly don't believe that if there is life after death, it will include uh, an I or a me or a continuation of self or um, anything which includes my intact memories. Um, so I, um, it is astounding to me though, you know, I'm a very, you know, uh, I believe in science and I probably an agnostic, but uh, there's still so much we don't know. You know, we don't know what consciousness is mm -hmm. or where it came from or what it's for. We don't know, um, you know, what began the universe or um, we don't know what even constitutes the universe. Um, and so I'm willing to accept that there is um, so much we don't know. And I'm a big believer in the mystery over the miracle. So, uh, and some people can feel comfortable with mystery and I'm one of those people. I like not knowing, but rather than taking our ignorance and just picking one thing and settling on something, I prefer the kind of endless and relentless imagining of possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I kind of keep returning to the idea of death and, and and what happens after and mystery and, and if there's a God and what kind of God it would be, because um, it seems strange to me that we settle on maybe two or three notions and we decide we need to pick between those. Yeah. Whereas there's a billion things we haven't thought of, you know, where one of our greatest attributes is our imagination and we just don't really use it enough sure yeah i totally agree like um in 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 this book alongside its heavy sad and drama there are lots of funny moments so that it could even be categorized under the comedy genre how do you balance this uh two atmosphere yeah, that is a hard thing. And that is something that um, is part of the work for me, like part of the editing. I take a lot of pleasure in writing. Mm -hmm. I'm lucky that way. And I know a lot of writers who complain about writing, uh, mm -hmm. who don't enjoy it and find it quite difficult. I really love writing, but you know, when I'm creating what is kind of the platonic idea of the book, Mm -hmm. I do have to 
like I like to um, tell a story. I like to include lots of ideas uh, because um, those interest me. I also have a natural um, and almost inescapable style, which includes a lot of comedy and humor. Mm -hmm. And I have to prune it away to make sure that it doesn't um, take away from the reality of the characters and the, and the propulsion of the story. So it is, um, that is a case of sort of sculpting the, the work. I mean, I write a lot. And then I kind of, it's like being a sculptor, except you also have to make the stone before you chip it away. Um, I end up having a, a file on my computer of all the words that I've cut out. And by the end of every book, that file is, is almost a thousand pages. <laughs> um, so that's sort of how, that's just the process that I, mm -hmm. that I use. Yeah. One of the things of the narrative of this book is that the belief of the characters are being challenged. For example, uh, the atheist character ironically faces the life after death. What is your opinion on this paradoxical situation? Oh, I think that well, that's also part of the fun, I think, that I wanted to have in writing of this is that I wanted the afterlife to be, you know, a, a sort of the book to be a slap in the face to the atheist who believes there is nothing and, but also to religious people yeah. who would believe that the afterlife is, you know, for their specific group. Mm. Um, and I think that... I just wanted to attack the hubris of human beings and the certainty of our beliefs mm -hmm. um, because there's just no reason to expect that we're right about much of anything. Okay. And our, our intuitions are, all, are almost always wrong. Um, <laughs> and so um, I feel that you know, one of the things to do in a book or in any kind of creation of a story is to put your characters in, in some kind of jeopardy or, you know, to, to face some kind of challenge. And because I love, I'm a lover of ideas, I, what I want to challenge is, um, is ideas. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's just uh, yeah. something that I, that I like to do. You did it beautifully. Um, in your recent book, the social media present is so strong and visible and that one of the characters named Gracie is addicted to the social media, but it also helps her in further in the book. What is your point of view on social media? Uh, I think we think humanity has gone down a really wrong path mm -hmm. sure. um and i think that we're all i've never met i now do not know a single adult who is not addicted yeah. to um social media and the internet and i don't think there's a problem with it per se it's it's just its ubiquity and so um you know, the character in my novel, uh, the narrator, Angus, says to his wife one day, Gracie, you know, maybe what if you only looked at your phone on a Sunday? Because social media seems like a nice thing to do on a Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of believe that. I'm like, there's nothing wrong with it in itself. But we look at it 100 times a day. And, you know, the hours that everybody spends on it, it's... Um, it's destroying the ability, the human ability to focus. Yeah, um, sure. And of course, all its threats to different democracies around the world. And yeah. Um, yeah, I think the problem came for uh, society when they introduced uh, Wi-Fi <laughs> because, because there was a period of the internet where you had to be on a computer that was 
connected to a on a desk and you had to sit at your desk mm -hmm. and you could only do that for so long but as soon as you went to the couch and then went to the street and i mean yeah, yeah. it's uh it's the problem is that it's all the time everywhere yeah um yeah we need to somehow reverse it yeah exactly um in your um in your book we see a fatal disease pandemic that reminds us of the covid-19 how has this pan pandemic affected you as a writer um my fictional one or the real one <laughs> both <laughs> Well, uh, for better or worse, I actually wrote that pandemic section in 2019. So oh, wow. oh my yeah. God. <laughs> so I, I had spent a lot of 2019 reading books about, um, you know, about pandemics and zoonotic diseases. And, um, you know, I, I also wanted to kind of poke fun at people's obsession with their dogs. So which is why I made... <laughs> which is why I made the dogs the source. It's a little bit mean. Uh, made the dogs the source of the pandemic. Um, it has, in, you know, it, it was difficult here as it was everywhere. I was locked down, you know, and I have a small child who lives with me. And so, you know, schools were closed. And so writing during the pandemic was, was tricky. But... I've been through a lot of things in different things in my life and they don't really change my ability to create. Um, so in many ways for a writer, it was not that, um, that much of a hardship because I write at home anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, you certainly the, the end of socialization for a period was, was tricky. Mm -hmm. Yeah um um in your book after the pandemic the morality of the characters of the book are being challenged has the morals of the man changed after covid in your opinion what do you think about that the morals of like of men in particular and no uh in, in human being oh I mean, um no, no. <laughs> not at all. I mean, think about, I mean, we, we've, we've lived through an, an unnaturally long period without a pandemic, I think. And I, I think that we have thought, um, certainly in the West, that, you know, we were at this end of history period mm -hmm. where, you know, traditional warfare was over and, um, we were moving towards a kind of brighter future. Um, and we've just been reminded that, you know, the history of the human race is a history of, um, you know, of famine, of pestilence, mm -hmm. and of war. And um, just because we had this kind of long break from it, uh, yeah doesn't mean it was over it just meant we were in a pause you know that may yeah. perhaps uh um you know it, it was an extended break but now you know we have the war in ukraine we have um you know a pandemic um and so i feel that this is just another natural part and um i've i see no evidence that that any of that has has improved anybody morally in mm -hmm. any way in like um as as it wasn't improved in the spanish flu of you know of, yeah. nine, of 1919 so mm -hmm. um yeah i think we are generally unimprovable uh <laughs> by unless you know within the time spans that we're dealing with you know maybe if humans lived another 100, 200, 300,000, we would Maybe. start to see some improvements. Maybe. I, I don't Maybe. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the beauty of reading, you know, the oldest works of literature. Um, I remember when I was younger and reading, you know, uh, sort of things from, you know, ancient Rome and, you know, mm -hmm. um, 
even from you know from the 17th century it's sort of shocking how much human beings haven't changed yeah you know? yeah there just isn't there just hasn't been enough time what what we consider a long time is nothing yeah exactly i think so also because it's it may be maybe a luck that this we had this extended peace i don't know no war no pandemic or so yeah yeah in all your books, uh, we read many philosophical statements from the characters, and especially in your book, Here Goes Nothing, you stress on the concept eternal return of Nietzsche. We would like to uh, know more about this. Okay, well, I mean, my I have two different uh, things that I personally love in philosophy uh one of them is i mean i'm a fan of nietzsche and schopenhauer and my and uh i don't know if you know sioran the um romanian philosopher uh one strand of philosophy i like is really psychological is the um, just kind of the accurate descriptions of, of human nature Mm -hmm. which um, I think that certain philosophers are really great at. The other uh, strand is, um, I guess, postulating possibilities of human existence um, and kind of metaphysical puzzles. Mm -hmm. And in that way, I find Nietzsche's eternal return not that much different from a short story by Borges. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, they, they are little short, you know, little um, thought experiments. Um, and so I kind of see those kind of thought experiments as um, little fictional constructs in the same way yeah, as like Borges's um, library you know it, of of babel or um sorry lottery of babel or his eternal libraries uh, the labyrinth mm -hmm. um all these kind of ideas um as a lover of fiction and a lover of ideas and a lover of philosophy that's just it's kind of a blend for me yeah i agree and you read lots of philosophical books or like historical books still or yeah, I'd like to, I do kind of oblique research into my, um, like, I don't do a lot of factual mm -hmm. research, um, but I, because I like to just use my imagination, to tell stories, mm -hmm. but I do like to read a lot of psychology, science and philosophy. And so, for instance, if I'm going to write something about dreams then you know I'm going to read Freud and Jung and yeah. you know and then and then see you know what other advancements there are in dreams and scientific journals and um, just to be telling my little fictional story um, yeah so I do uh, it's always story specific if I'm trying to write um, um, something I will do very wide research Mm. um about the it thematically yeah um in your recent book uh there is an iranian sub character secondary character also in one of uh, the early chapters there is a um, reference to farsi speaking poet Khaleb Dehlavi. according to that how familiar are you with middle east literature especially iran's I am, I would say not very familiar at all. <laughs> I would like to do a, um, I would like to be more familiar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I, I have come across certain things, but um, yeah, I, I cannot speak too much towards it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's okay. um, so let's go to more general questions now. Um, how important is the audience to you while you're writing? Um, it is not, I, again, I'm, I'm trying to write what is kind of the best version of the book as possible. And so I consider myself 
you know, the ideal reader. I'm sort of reading, a, a, writing a book that I would like to read, mm -hmm. but also um, I still, I don't write on the computer. I write by hand, um, like by pen and paper. And so um, I feel that when I write, uh, my hand works faster than my mind sometimes. And so if I write something, I'm always surprised by what I write. So I am in very much a very real sense, my first reader. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I certainly don't worry about, um, you know, offending sensibilities or um, upsetting people or, you um, or whether I just I'm just kind of trying to be as honest as I can while also not being indulgent. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I like books that are entertaining as well as um, as well as sort of deep and philosophical and um, and difficult. So I, it's just kind of a balance to try and do it, but I don't have a specific reader in mind. And in fact, I'm probably the type of writer if I was, if I was independently wealthy, I may just not, not publish them in my lifetime. <laughs> I don't know. I might just bury them in the ground and... Oh. <laughs> No, you should not do that. <laughs> like, yeah, like I'll enjoy reading. The thank you. Yeah, I think about Pessoa, who had you know they found mm -hmm. you know a big trunk of his papers at the end of his life, and that's where his book of disquiet comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, I I might do the same. Yeah, actually, lots of writers are like that. They are published after. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, which which authors or artists has inspired you to write, especially your last book? Um, I do continually return to um, a few writers. Um, Knut Hampson, mm -hmm. um, the Norwegian uh, writer. Um, won a Nobel Prize, right? Yes, yeah. he won, yes. However, he gave that Nobel Prize to Goering, uh, as a gift so he was uh you know he was in prison for kind of collaborating with the with with, with the nazis but uh he was an old man at that point and he, he i think he just hated the english um so but so I, yeah i returned to his works and dostoevsky and um the french writer celine uh very much but i also um really uh spent a lot of time reading the american writer dennis johnson mm -hmm. i don't know if you know him his his book of short stories jesus's son mm -hmm. um is just a very beautiful book that is tells um stories in a way that is both simple profound and spiritual and surreal and absurd and uh i would like that <laughs> yeah so I, I just kind of wanted to um yeah i was kind of trying to do something a little bit like that in this book um because my last book mm -hmm. was about it was very difficult because i wanted to tell a book uh, to write a book that was about exhaustion mm -hmm. and so it was difficult to write a book about exhaustion without it being exhausting. <laughs> and so uh, I really wanted, so my characters in the second book, Quicksand, mm -hmm. it was very dense and, I, and it was like a lot of, uh, just a lot of talking and um, long pages of paragraphs. Um, so this book, I wanted to kind of do the opposite. I feel like I'm always trying to do the opposite from the last thing. That's great. That's great. Um, you you have published three long novels. Um, do you have any plans on writing short stories or other forms of storytelling? I mean, I want my novels to get shorter. Uh, <laughs> so just because I don't really want to spend seven years on the next one, uh, I want to 
you know, um, mm -hmm. do it a little bit faster. Um, but I, I mean, I also have a have an idea of doing a book of three ghost stories. I have an idea of doing books uh, of two different stories about prison. I'm very interested in prisons as a, I don't know why, all my books have prisons in them generally, and uh, maybe not mm -hmm. this one. Uh, but um, so yeah, I have lots of different things to do and I, I feel like everything I do is going to just get shorter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have any routine or ritual when you write? If yes, how is that? Yeah, I mean, I write, I try to write in two hour blocks and then I fit as many of those in the day as possible. But I also like to move around a lot. So I will do those two hours of writing in every two hours is in a different location. So I do two hours at, you know, in my kitchen, then two hours at the beach, then two hours in a park, two hours in a cafe uh, or the library or, you know, the cemetery or somewhere different because it's, you know, I don't have my computer. I'm just with my uh, notebook mm -hmm. and which makes me very mobile. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my route, my routine. Yeah, that's that's great. Moving is always is always good. Yeah. What is some of your favorite hobbies? Oh, hobbies. <laughs> uh, I play guitar. Oh. Yeah. Great. So I like to play guitar and sing a little bit. Um, you I've also been... write songs. Yeah, I write songs as okay. well, <laughs> but I don't play them for anyone. It is literally yeah. <laughs> a very private. Uh, my 10 year old son is the only person who's, who hears them. Um, and yeah, I sort of we I live in an area where there's a lot of hiking trails. So hiking, I really love cinema is my other love. And so um, you know, I used to, before I write novels, I wanted to be a filmmaker. So I made a lot of short films and, um, so yeah, I, I try to go to the cinema as often as possible. Yeah. Uh, do you have, uh, any advice or words for aspiring writers? Um, I would say, first of all, uh, well, the main thing is you have to be widely read. That's, you have to read a lot. Mm -hmm. And there's no, I've never, I mean, the one thing that all writers, you know, good writers have in common, you know, doesn't matter where they are in the world or what age they are or what gender or ethnicity or race, the one single thing they all have in common is that they have read a lot. Mm -hmm. So you have to, you know, continually read. You'd be surprised at how many writers, young writers uh, want to write a book and, and don't read very much. Uh, it's impossible. But, um, and the other thing is that it's impossible to be good at first. You know, you have to um, be at peace with uh, failing for a long time, yeah. really. Um, and to just try and get into the habit of finishing things. So write, if you're trying to write a story, don't give up halfway, even if you lose interest in it or don't think it's good, just finish it. And then, you know, every writer just, uh everything has to be bad i mean my first drafts now are are bad um so you you have to accept to mm -hmm. write bad things and then sort of improve them yeah that's the acceptance yeah I think so and the other thing i would say especially for a novel is that you not every time you sit down to write if you're writing a novel you're not writing a novel you're just writing a paragraph mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm what you need to uh, do. And even if it's, you know, break everything into the smallest possible um, 
components and just work on that at one. You can only do one thing at one time. And, you know, it's at the level of a sentence or at most the level of a paragraph. And if you just focus on that over time, it, it accumulates. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> what is your plan for future writings? Um, my next, well, now that I feel like I'm done with writing about fear, because I've written three books, mm -hmm. which include fear, um, I'm very interested in um, consciousness and um, the nature of consciousness and mm -hmm. free will and uh, those kind of topics. Mm -hmm. So um, perhaps my new book is, a, is the first in a loose trilogy about consciousness um, and artificial intelligence and um, the future of humanity. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I'm, yeah, I'm doing, I have a, I'm about a third of the way through a new book. So I am, I am writing, uh, I, I feel like I've uh, written a lot in the past year of this new book. Um, so I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna do that. I actually know the next three books I'm gonna write. So. <laughs> oh, um, great. Yeah. <laughs> And the subjects were my favorite, which you uh, mentioned just. Okay. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, due to the recent situation in the world, and also considering uh, your recent novel that addresses some of the recent world issues, uh, imagine having a microphone and the whole world can hear you. What would you tell them? Oh my god! <laughs> I <don't> no. <laughs> um, what would I tell them? I, I well, look again. I think if there's one thing we can do, it is to to you know turn off the internet. <laughs> I, I I know it's a, it's because it's the newest form. It's you can't tell human beings not to go to war or just, you know, to be competitive, you know, in a, in um, a world or be, you know, don't be selfish or anything like that, because that's part of human nature. Yeah. But, um, you know, deep focus and, you know, consideration of other people is, uh, you know, yeah, that we've, we've gone, we're, we're only we're only 10 years down a bad path and we can just reverse it basically yeah. so i would say do that yeah exactly thank you so uh, if you're interested can you read part of your new book to our audiences now yes um, um sorry this is from the middle of the book um this is uh, Angus Mooney talking about his um, living conditions in the afterlife. My own living situation went from bearable to untenable. The neighbors were hedonistic, unhygienic maniacs. All day and all night long, I could hear arguing. The sound of a person almost but never quite reaching orgasm and a man's voice shouting, no, I won't lower my voice. My shit-faced neighbors lurked in the dark corridors, held nightly drunken seances to contact the living, sang dueling national anthems in the shower. A reckless aura hung over everything. Doors were left wide open and people with obscene radiant faces tried to coax me into eightsomes. Sure, there's a case to be made that moving from languishing on one's deathbed to a sprightly midnight orgy gave one the right to act like a demigod, but I had a bad feeling that a lot of these folks had committed terrible earthly misdeeds that had gone unpunished and now felt they could get away with anything. The lights in the hallway had all been intentionally broken and some people on my floor decided to break down the barriers between them, literally and began demolishing the walls. This was the frenzy of second life. Wow, thank you. I could listen to it for hours. Oh, thank you. And yeah, um, so, I'm so happy now. Getting to know you, you're also a very cool 
we have also very cool personality and yeah oh, yeah thanks. i'm so happy to meet you here and thank you for taking the time and oh, thank you thank you yeah it was really nice to chat to you do you have any last words <laughs> No, I mean, I, um, I'm very uh, appreciative of uh, readers uh, in Iran, and I would love to know why they, my books have, uh, yeah. you know, I feel that maybe it's uh, because I don't, you know, there is, there is a large uh, Iranian population here where I live in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. although um, I'm not, I won't be here. I won't be here very much longer. I'm moving back to Australia. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm, I suspect it's because, you know, I don't know, there seem to be a, you seem to be a philosophical group of people. Yeah, um, yeah, sure. Mm. And so have, have responded in that way. But um, exactly. yeah, I, I thank you all for reading. Oh.